today on Dr. Phil. All we're gonna ask is you sit here and listen. Dude. I don't care what you're asking me, Dr. Who are you? Yeah, come down. You guys trapped me? Are you telling me to calm down? She went into a full drug-fueled rage. She of course it is you. He's yelling at his face. Stop it now. Now. Get off of me. Get off of me. You need this. She's far sickest individual I've ever worked with. You're her mother, and you're standing in the background of saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. If this doesn't work, she's never going to speak to me again. This is your chance to be the mother you feel you should have been then. Lord. the last time you will ever see me. This is going to be a changing day in your life. Have a good show, everybody. Here we go. If it matters to you, that's what I want to talk about. Are you ready to move? Take Let's do it. I'm yelling at you because you don't see me for what I am. Well, that is typical addict behavior, screaming, making excuses, irrational outbursts. No one knows how a drug addict behaves better than Brandon. Brandon is now five years sober, and he and his mother, Debbie, are paying it forward. Now, our goal this season is to help families who have lost all hope as they try to deal with drug addiction. Now, just last week, Brandon met his match. Right now, we're uh, coming up on the, on the apartment complex that Jamie lives in, so we're going to do a drive-by, kind of look and see what the apartment complex looks like. I'm going to go by her house to kind of get a feel of what's going on there, to get a feel of the apartment to kind of feel feel the climate and to see where the safest place to do this intervention is. If we feel comfortable going to her apartment or if we need to do it at your house. That's her boyfriend right there. That was her boyfriend there walking down the street. There's a Mercedes sitting back here, very nice car. The Mercedes just took off. I bet it did. Too well. They were here doing nothing good. Think of a plan of different ideas on ways that she would come meet up with you at the house would be the best. Yeah. Best thing if we get her to the house some, somehow. Brainstorm through the night, you do some thinking, praying, and we'll do the same. We'll come up with something, and we'll, we'll figure this out tomorrow. Good to see you. Thank you guys for being here and supporting this process. We are here to fight for Jamie's life. What drugs do you know for a fact that she's using and how much? Yeah, um, it started Oxycontins. Of late, um, she started injecting uh, cocaine. My daughter Jamie is 23 years old and she's addicted Jamie to Oxycontins. Oxycontins. Oxycontin in different ways. Snorted off shooting up Oxycontins. In ninth grade, Jamie started using Percocets. Percocets. Smoked marijuana. Cocaine. Injected cocaine. She, crack. she has done crack. crack. I could see by Jamie's arm she had bruises from her shoulders down to her wrist. It looked like she had been injected in the same spot. When I saw that the first time, I almost fell to the floor. It became very real. I knew it was bad. Growing up with Jamie, we were very close. She was like a second mom to me. I always looked up to her. She was one of the most important people in my life. I haven't talked to her in a few months because her problem really started to escalate and my mom was trying to protect me. She was a complete tyrant. She just wasn't Jamie anymore. When you look into her eyes, it wasn't her. She wasn't herself. You couldn't talk to her. You couldn't communicate. Jamie's drug abuse has affected Kim in many ways. She doesn't get a lot of sleep at night. Every time the phone rings, she's afraid to answer it. She's afraid to walk in and find her daughter dead. When Jamie first told me she was addicted, my family and I did an intervention. We got her into detox. She stayed there for three hours and checked herself out. She ran, and that night she attempted suicide. The police found Jamie laying on her kitchen floor. I thought my daughter was going to die. And she was foaming at the mouth. You 
never envisioned seeing your daughter like that. This is the end of the road for her. I can see it, I feel it, and I know it's coming. And I've got to save my daughter. We're all here to save her life. We need help. Please save her. We can't get enough help. And she's worth saving. She's a beautiful girl. I just want her back because every time there was something wrong, I always went to her. She was like my sister. I just want her to get better. So bad. Here's how this works. Our plan is for Kim to go pick her up to bring her here. We're all going to be here ready and prepared to intervene on her as soon as she comes in the door. If we see that she's escalating or it gets dangerous for her, for any one of you, or for us, we will stop the process. Talk calm. And if she says anything, if she attacks or says things that are derogatory, like if she says to you, you're such a bitch, you know, I can't believe you're doing this, don't take it personal. Have a wall. Don't respond to it. Don't fire back. It feeds the addiction. I do need someone to be responsible to call 911 if it gets it to a dangerous situation. We don't know how out of control she's going to be. I can't restrain her. I can't do anything to her. Okay, is everybody on board? Because we're going to go ahead and establish contact with her. Hi, Jane. It's Mom calling. I just want to let you know I took the day off work today, and I wanted to see about coming to see you. Right now, you know, we're headed over to Jamie's apartment. We're following Jamie's mother. We're going to see if Jamie's home, and then uh, her mother's going to drive her back to the house. We're going to pounce and do the intervention there. All right, right now, they, uh, they just came out of the building. Uh, Jamie and her boyfriend just uh, loaded up in the car, and they're pulling away from the building right now and about to drive by us on our left. Who's holding you down? Nobody. OK, and I'm going to walk out the door. No one's going to hold me? You're not holding. You haven't even heard what we have to say. Quit yelling, please. Hey. Do you have it? Hey, man, just hold on. Why are you so upset? What, what's wrong? You hear us out. That's you all see we're it? asking. You see what they do to me? Are, are, you see? I trust you. Hold on. Are you? You're going to leave? He, he's not <laughs> Look, all we want to do is talk. All this is That's it. Talk. Okay? Just, yeah, calm down. I know this was a surprise. Just, you know, calm down. Please. Don't! I don't know who you are. Don't come near me. Let me see your arms. You see the bruises? All right. 
Can we please talk? Okay, you don't have to say anything. All we're going to ask is you sit here and listen to your family. Not to me, not to anybody that you don't know, but to your family. Your mother. Then why are you talking? Are you, you going to sit and listen? No. No. All we're asking you to do is I don't sit. care what you're asking me to do. I'm asking you to leave me alone. <laughs> you're you're out sorry? Out Kimberly? You're out of control. This is the last time you'll ever no. see me. Well, obviously, this got very dramatic, but what happens next shocked the entire family as the intervention continues when we come back. Are you worried about her at all? Yeah, man. You know what? Don't you include him. Stop it now! Now! Lucas does nothing but help! This is your family. You can't hold me like that. I'm calling you. You can leave as soon as we talk to you. But how are you going to sit here and tell me I'm out of my mind? Because I've been where you're at. Now, I asked Brandon and Debbie to help us with an intervention here. But when Jamie showed up, she went into a full drug-fueled rage, and no one could predict how it was going to end. All we're asking you to do is... I don't care what you're asking me to do. I'm asking you to leave me alone. <laughs> you're out of control. Sorry? Kimberly? You're out of control. This is the last time you will ever see me. I don't want to be here. I don't want to go home. You think they want to be I don't care what they want. Okay? All? Okay, look. Let's start over. Can we start no, over? No! I want to go home. No, no. You don't even know me. No, I don't know so you. So then how are you going to sit here and tell me I'm out of my mind? Because I've been where you're at. I don't care about your life and your sad, sob story. And I don't even want you here. Okay, that's fine. I don't know why you're talking to me. Take a breath. Calm down. I understand this is a shock. But yelling and screaming is not going to no, get actually, anything we saw. This is what I expect. Okay. Talk to us. My name's Debbie. I'm a counselor and a nurse. This is my son, Brandon. He has been where you are. Your family is worried about you. I can't believe you would all embarrass Hold me down. in front of Luke like this. Do you know how embarrassed I am right now? Luke is no, also you don't get, worried. No, no, wait, no, no, wait. Don't you? No, don't, no, don't, don't, don't you involve him. He would don't. never do this to me. Luke, are you aware that no, she's... No, don't you include him in this. Okay. Luke, if you walk outside, don't you include him in this. Okay. He's not a backstabbing, lying piece of Okay, that's all of us. That's fine. You're going to leave me here? No, 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 no,
you. You don't like the way I'm talking to your mother. I don't like the way you're talking to me or my good, boyfriend, the good. people I care about. I don't like the situation I walked into when a loving family is trying to help you save to save your life. You see yourself? You don't know me. Look at don't your Don't assume. Anymore. So what? That's How is me. that your business? I'm done. The police are here. You can yeah, you talk to them. Come on outside with us for a second. We'll talk about it. Well, um, only difference between you five years ago and her is she has a ponytail. Yeah, and shorter shorts than I wear. Yeah, because you, I mean, seriously, yeah. this is what I want people to know and understand as we go forward here. This behavior is not atypical in any way. realizes, wait a minute, somebody is getting ready to threaten my access to drugs. Somebody is getting ready to threaten my ability to do what I've been doing. What did you think when you heard all of this coming out of her mouth? It's not unusual. Uh, we, we often see this type of behavior. We were watching her more than what was coming out of her mouth in order to be able to respond and keep everyone safe. Now, if you suspect that your child is using drugs, I want you to go to DrPhil.com because Brandon has some firsthand advice of what to look for. Having lived that life of an active addict every day, he's going to be your friend at the factory and tell you, here's where they hide it, here's how they do it, these are the things to look for, just kind of the tricks and trade of those that are living this self-destructive life. Coming up, we're going to see what happened after the police arrived, and we're going to find out why an ambulance had to be called to the scene as well. Now, Brandon and Debbie uh, led an intervention to get Jamie to La Hacienda Treatment Center. But when Jamie arrived at her mother's house, she got totally out of control in clearly a, a drug-fueled panic. Now, the police were called, which is exactly what should happen if things get out of control. You heard Debbie very early, before the intervention started, she said, I want to designate someone here that's going to call 911 if things get out of control. The number one rule in any intervention is safety and security of everybody involved. Let's take a look at what happened next. Police were called because she went out of control. She's uh, the far sickest individual I've ever worked with. It's much better that the police are here than if you're standing at her coffin. Okay. The police contact the ambulance to have medical professionals come here and actually check her out. That way they can have a, a medical assessment and determine what the next step is. This is a start. This is a start. She's calmed down in there. The door's open. The police are talking to her. She doesn't I know how hard it is for the family to see something like this happen. I can't tell you how difficult it is to see someone you love in handcuffs or taken away, but it may be the only thing that saves her life. Likely what's going to happen is she will go from here to the hospital, they'll, they'll evaluate it, they'll call what's called a, like a psych response team to get an evaluation um, to see where she's at psychologically. We're not going away. You know, we're going to see this through to the end. That's what Dr. Phil does. The goal here is to get her the help she desperately needs and deserves. We are going to go to the hospital right now and speak to the doctor at, as the officer suggested we do um, and plead with him to keep her at least the 72 hours uh, for observation to get her calmed down. We just had a conference with the police officers as well as the three physicians who have evaluated her. They are going to go ahead and hold her for 24 hours. There's going to be a psychiatric evaluation in the morning 
with a possible 72-hour hold. Hopefully they can, they, they can do the evaluation tomorrow and we can get her on her way to treatment in the morning. We, we definitely haven't lost any, any hope for this case. Um, you know, as long as there's a beating heart and she's still alive, she's safe for tonight, we're still going to be here you know, trying to get her, get her the help she needs. Well, joining me now is Jamie's mother, Kim, and her stepfather, Rudy. Now, Jamie's younger brother, Chris, who you saw in the intervention, is in the audience as well. Chris, thanks for being here. One of the things that bothered me about this, in this intervention, we have Debbie and Brandon, who are, are there on my behalf, who bring an expertise, and it's clear they did. And, and you've got a 15-year-old son over here who is taking the lead in this almost as a parent trying to contain his older sister, and you're standing in the background saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Now, you say it's because you feel guilty. If you feel guilty about having done things wrong, wouldn't this be the time to step up and do something right? It's like, okay, I have a chance. I have reached out to Dr. Phil. He has sent me the pros from Dover. We have a team here. We have a plan. We have a place to go. I am actually bringing you something that is life-saving, healthy, and good, and I'm going to stand back and apologize for that. I don't get that. I'm afraid of Jamie. Um, I was afraid of, of her reaction. Um, I felt if this doesn't work, she's never going to speak to me again. If this doesn't work, she'll never speak to you again because she won't be able to. So you were basically being selfish in this situation. You, you wanted to kind of play the, the good guy, not take the lead and, and be the bad cop here because you didn't want her to be mad at you. Look, this isn't even almost over. You, you've got to plug in here. The, you can screw this up big time if, if we don't get some clarity about what's going on here. You very rightly said, call 911. Not going to play this game. You contained her. I hated to see you have to do that. Uh, I'm glad that that you had initiative and that you love and care about your sister. I, I, I don't think that's a job for a 15-year-old. And it got more physical than I wanted it to get. I, I would have waited for the police to come and calm this situation down. But you were passive in this, and you can't be passive in this, Kim. To learn. She's bullied you. She's intimidated you. Do you agree with that, Rudy? Uh, I agree with that. You're absolutely correct. Um, Jamie has just seems to know how to manipulate Kim, and it's happened often. I guess she's just afraid. She doesn't know where she's going to go, what she's going to do. Well, all right. So, where is she going to go? How far will she push this, and what's the outcome going to be? We're going to talk about all of that, and what needs to happen next when we come back. are watching daytime's number one talk show okay i'm here with brandon uh debbie uh kim and rudy now kim is jamie's mother uh rudy is the stepfather uh chris is here he's the younger brother that took a very active role in this intervention and kim i seem to be focusing on you here because you're her mother and you've not wanted to deal with any of this because you don't want her to be upset with you because she can exact a toll. She can yell and scream, you're never going to see me again. You're never going to speak to me again. You're, you're seeing me for the last time. How could you do this to me? I hate you for this. You've betrayed me. All of those things. And that, that gets to you, right? Yes. Uh, so you would rather do what it takes to make yourself feel better than to give her a chance to get this monkey off her back and, and have a chance to live? I never looked at it that way. I... Well, let's look at it that yeah. way. It's like, okay, I can tell her what she wants to hear, so maybe she won't be mad at me, and therefore I won't feel like I've failed her, even though I know I am. Because I know, as her mother, I need to tell her the truth. I need to lead her to treatment. I need to be a strong person in this that requires her to stand up and be the intelligent young woman she can be. But she might not like me for that, so I'm going to do what makes me feel better and the hell with her. I, I have 
I have tried standing up to her in, in, in that way, and um, she blocks me out. She cuts me out. She always does come back when she needs something. And, and it, it scares me when, um, you know, she blocks me out because then I have absolutely no idea what she's doing, where she's at. So you disagree with what I'm saying? No, I totally agree with what you're saying. Well, I'm no, just you don't because you're saying, no, 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 I have stood up to her before. I'm just not standing up to her now. I, I'm, I'm allowing her to kill herself now. And, you, Kim, you can't do that. L listen. Your role in this going forward is huge. Debbie, how important is this? I mean, you've been through this. Brandon, how important was it that your mother finally stood up and said, that's enough? It was, it was huge. I mean, she was the biggest enabler in the world for me. She gave me the money to go get my drugs, even though she thought it was for clothes or food or whatever, but I could go make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich instead of going and buying a $20 meal. And I manipulated her and it, it, I was so sick that I, you know, I did that to my mother, and it, it, there was no link that I wouldn't go to to get what I needed. Mm -hmm. And she will continue to manipulate you and drive you crazy until you say enough is enough and get tough with her and say, that's it. I'm not putting up with this anymore. And, you know, it was when she got better is when I got better. Here's my point. If we get her to treatment... If she, do, if she turns things around, if she doesn't continue down the path she's on, and she comes back to the same dynamic that she has now, <laughs> what's the point? If you're feeling guilty because of what you subjected her to as a child, and so you're like, oh, I, I, I own this, I'm to blame for this, so I'm just going to sit over here and feel guilty, then there's no point in going through all this. If you don't decide, look, I can't change what has happened. I can apologize for it. I can go to therapy with her. I can make amends however I can. But the only time is now, and she deserves a future. I, you, you can be sorry about that, but you've got to forgive yourself. You've got to ask her forgiveness. You've got to live in the moment and give this girl a chance to live. Don't sabotage her when she's two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, up through her teens, and then sabotage her now. If you're right, if you sabotaged her unintentionally when she was growing up, don't do it again now. Isn't that what you're going to do if you continue to be afraid of her and let her dominate you and bully yes. you and enable her? Absolutely. Don't you wish you had that childhood to do over again? Oh. Well, you get a do-over right now. This is when you reparent. This is when you redo. This is your chance to be the mother you feel you should have been then. This is your chance to decide this isn't a popularity contest. I'm going to tell her what she needs to hear instead of what I need to tell her so I feel better. I'm asking you to power up. And I'm offering to help you do that, but you, I can't do it for you. I, I've had the same conversation with you. Absolutely. He's sitting in jail in Houston. I said, do not bail him out. Do not get him a lawyer. Do not get him out of jail. Let him say, how long were you there? Half a year, six months. Six months this kid sat in jail for doing black tar heroin, and she cried herself sleep every night because her little boy's in jail. But you know what? He was safe. Mm -hmm. I'd have rather have him alive in jail than dead on the street. As the hardest thing you ever did. Absolutely. Kim, you underestimate your power. And you, Jamie will start getting well when you get well. I heard that at an Al-Anon meeting. And then I sought her out to say, what does that mean? And what I did was every single thing she recommended. And I used her as a sponsor to guide me.
already true. Mm -hmm. Your chance of stopping this, doing what you're doing, is zero. The only chance that you won't be doing drugs this time next year is if you're dead. And later... I will never forget you! Find out where Jamie is now. Kim wrote the show after seeing our drug intervention with 20-year-old Carly. Now, Carly, like Kim's daughter Jamie, was defiant, did not want any help, and had just smoked OxyContin the morning of the show. My 20-year-old daughter, Carly, is addicted to drugs. In August of this year, she overdosed on heroin. She almost died. You've been doing drugs since when? Since I was 12? Eight years. You're as we speak. You OD'd already and had to be resuscitated, true? Mm -hmm. It's very common, especially in Newport. Ox Oxycontin is very big. Pretty much all of Orange County, I would say. I don't feel like it's a problem. I feel it's just something I do. Your chance of stopping this by going through some outpatient detox and doing therapy, living where you're living, doing what you're doing, is zero. The only chance that you won't be doing drugs this time next year is if you're dead. You've had three or four friends die in the last year from Oxycontin and or heroin. We were supposed to come to Dr. Phil's show and you couldn't get out of bed. You were very sick and you told me you couldn't go unless you had some oxy, so I gave you the money to go get it, and I feel horrible for that. I want you to be okay. I'm worried you're going to die. I can't live without you, Carly. Brandon sat in this chair. He's been through what you've been through. He's now four years clean and sober at it. He's just a boy version of you. Brandon, what do you want to say? I know you need this. I know where you're at. I know that you feel like you're in a dark place, but you don't want to accept the help. You don't know what it feels like to be normal anymore. Oxycontin's a very powerful opiate. It's the pharmaceutical grade of heroin. You can't. and get serious help or your life is going to get a whole lot worse in a short period of time. Will you take the help? Yes. Carly left the stage and went directly to treatment at the La Hacienda Center in Texas. That was nine months ago. Carly, come on out and join us. How you doing, girl? Good to see you. Me too. Very good to see you. Good job, Carly. Well, uh, just anywhere is fine. Well, you're a little more bright-eyed and bushy-tailed than the last time I saw you. Yep. So how are you feeling? Amazing. My life is so much different. I can't even... You've been sober for how long? I had nine months on the 15th. Nine months on the 15th. Um, you, you've been watching the show from backstage, right? Um... You've seen it all before. What do you think about what I'm saying to uh, Jamie's mother, Kim? I think it's all true. I mean, enabling is the hardest part of it all. My mom was a huge enabler, too. And if she wouldn't have brought me here and forced me to go to treatment, then I would have died. And it's, my life is so different now. And I don't know, it's, I never thought, no one ever thought I would stay sober. I never thought I would even be alive right now. And it's, if you really, if she really wants this and she works hard, La Hacienda will help her. And it's amazing there. What do you want to say, Sue? Um, I just wanted to say that I'm really proud of Carly. I've never thought she'd get here. And I want to tell you that Brandon was my hope. And now, hopefully, Carly can be your hope. Um, I know how I felt when I was sitting here. I felt just like you did, like you had no hope. But um, watching them is just 
I'm just so thankful. I've, it's changed my life. Um, uh, and I just wanted to tell you that I almost didn't call the, didn't write the show because I was afraid of Carly's reaction. I went behind her back and I was afraid. But I just kept talking to myself and saying, you know what? It's either she's going to die or she's going to not ever talk to you again. And at least she'd still be alive. Yeah. So those were my choices. And you just have to be the parent and step up to the plate and, you know, do what you have to do. I believe that she wants you to do that because you can ask either one of these two and they would say the same thing now. She needs you to do that for her. Now, if you're worried that you may be enabling your child's bad behavior, I want you to go to drphil.com right now and you can take our quiz on enabling. It's not all common sense. You may think, well, you either know it or you don't. That's not true. There are things that you go, well, I never thought of that as enabling. I thought I was giving him money for school or for food. Yeah, come on. They eat at a friend's house. They use the money to buy drugs. It's not all common sense. Take the quiz. Coming up, I'm going to tell you where Jamie is now and how she's doing. This is not a success-only journey. This is, an, this is a tough, tough disease. We'll be right back. We sent Brandon and Debbie to do an intervention with Kim on her 23-year-old daughter, Jamie, who is severely addicted to drugs. And, uh, of course, the, the last we saw here in the recap is she had gone to the hospital. She was on a psychiatric hold there to be evaluated. She did go to La Hacienda. Yes. Uh, now, there was drama along the way because when she got out, she said, okay, I'll go to treatment, but I want to spend a few days with my mother, and I want to go to L.A. and talk to Dr. Phil. I love Dr. Phil. I, I want to go look him in the eye and talk to him. And that seemed like a pretty good idea, right? So they called me, and I said, not just no, but hell no. <laughs> she goes straight to treatment, from the hospital to treatment. Rich Whitman is here. He's the director of the La Hacienda Treatment Center, and there are a lot of treatment centers here. We use different ones from time to time, particularly for those under 18, because La Hacienda is for um, adults. Uh, people, Rich, have asked me why I'm so high on La Hacienda. A big part of it is you. Thank you. Uh, because you get it, and I thank you for the work you guys do down there, and I thank you for it. <laughs> she made it to treatment. She fought it all the way. She fought it when she got there. But the worm is turning, and she seems to be embracing and immersing herself in the program. Things are moving in the right direction, possibly for the first time since this child was 12, 13 years old. So in a matter of just four or five days, a huge turn has happened in this young girl's life. Mm -hmm. So I hope you're excited about that. I'm very excited. And you've got to do the right thing and get yourself ready to be a player in this moving down the road. True? Yes. It's very important that the family get their minds right while you're getting your mind right. We'll be right back. Well, Jamie has been in rehab for four days now. Uh, she called her mom last night. What did she say to you, Kim? Um, she said, Mom, I have um, something I need to talk to you about. And she said, I just want to say thank you for getting me here. That's a far distance from where you were in, in, in that time in the intervention. And, you know, I, I've got notes and thoughts about doing interventions uh, on the website. You know, this is not about confrontation. It's not about being demanding and finger pointing. It's about dealing with the facts, being calm, being compassionate, being loving, being supportive, but being relentless that you will accept nothing other than this person getting a return to health. And all of that is, is right there on the website. I want to thank all of my guests today. 
Special thanks to Brandon and Debbie, Rich Whitman, director of La Hacienda. Now, you have also offered treatment to Jamie's boyfriend, Luke, at Origins Drug and Alcohol Recovery Center, because I don't want them in the same place. Now, I, and I understand that as soon as he gets his passport, he says that he is going to do that. He's going to come out of Canada with his passport, and he's going to go to treatment. We'll see whether he does or not. He hasn't raised his hand yet, right? Right. N not from what I understand. I've, it's your request. I've been in contact with Origins. I've, I've talked to them on the phone. Believe me, he hasn't made that phone line burn up yet. Um, but we'll see. Thanks for being here. So long.